final round, our final round. And great pleasure to introduce David. David, welcome to us again. Um, now, hands up all those who've got perfect pitch in the audience. Mary Ellen, you've got perfect pitch? Really? Oh. Anyone else who's got, you do, Tony, good God. <laughs> Just shows how random it is. Well, anyway, this is the subject of, <laughs> you threw me there completely, of David's PhD. He'll be recruiting you for studies after this. Um, but I believe there'll be more audi audience participation as it goes along. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you. You are indeed at the heart, along with our old friend Mike Travis of the National uh, Neurosciences Initiative. Have I got that right? Not quite. Pardon? <coughs> Curriculum initiative, yes, that is quite important, really, isn't it? Put that in. You're right, curriculum initiative. And uh, a man, I, I hate, there are two words I hate is passionate and inspirational. Therefore, that means it's quite difficult to actually introduce you without using either because you are both. But if you're now going to demonstrate, the floor is yours. <laughs> Simon, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it's an inspiring initiative that uh, you guys have underway. Lack of better words. Um, so in 2012, then director of the NIMH, Tom Insel, wrote an editorial entitled The Future of Psychiatry is Clinical Neuroscience. And the article captured beautifully some of the revolutionary changes that are transforming the field of psychiatry today. As I was putting together my slides, I couldn't help but put up a picture of Sigmund Freud alongside of Carl. And, and if we're... If we're going to put Carl there, we need one of his optogenetic rats there as well. And I, I, I don't show this to suggest that neuroscience is replacing psychotherapy. Um, I think as Carl was talking about uh, quite a bit, actually, there's tremendous value at looking across reductionistic levels and at the interface. But there really can be no doubt at this point um, how much our thinking about psychiatry is now informed by brain science. Um, and clearly, as people have been talking about this week, if we think of what psychiatry will look like in 10, 20, or 30 years, um, it will be neuroscience. And for a little bit of data, one figure to capture this, uh, what we're looking at here, the x-axis is the year, and the y-axis is the number of articles in PubMed with the keyword psychiatry and neuroscience. So what you see is exponential growth. And for those with particularly sharp eyes, you'll notice that this figure ends in 2012 when Tom wrote his article. And since then, we've continued to see really extraordinary growth with quadruple the number of articles now since then. And of course, it's not just the amount of work, the quality uh, and impact of the cutting edge uh, research is really just astonishing. So, I think it's all well and good to talk about the future of psychiatry, but my question is, uh, why aren't we doing this today? How do we take all of the extraordinary neuroscience we've been hearing about and translate it into the way we train our residents, into the way we talk to our patients? Um, we all know that this is important and this is our future. So what is it that's holding us back? And if we want to start thinking about the barriers to teaching neuroscience effectively, it starts at a systems level. We can't ignore that. So for us, the system is the ACGME. Um, Gareth's been helping me this week. So uh, I'm told that the ACGME is the equivalent of the GMC here. Uh, so the group that creates all of our regulatory uh, requirements. And for us, they've created the program requirements for graduate medical education in psychiatry. This is a riveting 38-page document with about 10,000 words. In it, you will find every requirement under the sun for all the different kinds of psychotherapy that you have to do, down to mandated nap time for residents when they're on call. There are two separate references for that. Anybody want to guess what word does not appear a single time in the program requirements? Zero. So if you're keeping score at home, naps, two, neuroscience, zero. So it is really inspiring to see that the Royal College is taking steps to change the way you define the curriculum for psychiatry here. Uh, you're way ahead of us in, in this regard. So if this is what our system is doing, what's the impact on programs? If, if I can borrow Gareth one more time. I think that's a course. <laughs> so our, our programs are required to track with these requirements, and the requirements largely track with the history of our field. Um, as new ideas have developed, they've been gradually added in, and so what you're left with is, is something of a vestigial organization. So there's a series of courses, each of which is divided into a series of lectures. So if you looked at a traditional curriculum and you wanted to think about a topic like PTSD, you might have one course that covers diagnosis and phenomenology, another on psychodynamics, psychopharmacology, CBT, uh, if you're lucky, a little bit of psychosocial rehabilitation. And if you're really, really lucky in the States, you might get some neuroscience. I have to admit, as a program director, a 
course organizer. Um, <laughs> that one was hard to remember. <laughs> It would be lovely if the world worked this way. It would appeal to the obsessive compulsive personality in all of us that we could neatly parse the world into these categories and it would make all of our teaching easier. But of course this is ridiculous. This is not the way the world works. And the beauty of psychiatry, what draws us to our field is the complexity of how all of these pieces of the puzzle fit together. So if we wanted to think about something like PTSD today, well, fundamentally any conversation has to begin with what happens in the brain following a traumatic experience. And you get fear conditioning. And with fear conditioning, you get dysregulation of the connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And once you start to think about fear conditioning, then you realize that any effective treatment is gonna have to include a component of exposure therapy to extinguish that. And now we can start tapping into all of the really cool neuroscience that's going on today. So what if we had a medication like decycloserine that could increase the intrinsic plasticity of the brain so that you could get through your exposure therapy in five or six sessions instead of 10 to 12? something that's already been done for acrophobia. There's a whole new field of research showing that any time a memory is activated, it becomes momentarily labile and then has to be reconsolidated. What if we could disrupt the reconsolidation process, as has been done in animals pharmacologically, as has been done in humans interventionally with ECT, and of course behaviorally with some elegant paradigms. If we step back, we realize for any particular trauma, it's probably only 20 or 30% of people who are gonna go on to develop PTSD, depending on the type of trauma. So this might lead us to say, well, it's not the event per se, but the way in which an individual is interpreting that event and contextualizing it within their own life narrative. And so we might wanna start thinking about cognitive behavioral therapy. And of course, how do we think about all of the different psychosocial rehabilitation approaches? So supportive employment, supportive housing, family, psychoed. We've already seen some of the data today about how ineffective our medications are for depression. They're worse for PTSD. So how do we take these treatments, all of which have much larger effect sizes than the medications we prescribe? As MDs, we love talking about medications, but this is how our patients get better. And really, how do we make this about the person who's sitting in front of us? So what's it like to go to Iraq for 14 months where you're convinced every day that you're gonna die? And you come home and you try driving on a freeway that reminds you of an IED explosion and you try shopping in a mall where the, the, the crowd is just too stimulating to be able to tolerate? The heart of psychiatry is how does all of this fit together today? And this is how we need to be thinking about this. So let's imagine a program wanted to implement a new cutting edge neuroscience curriculum. Um, they still face a number of intense challenges. So, so foremost, what should we actually be teaching? The field is vast, and it's moving too quickly to keep up, even if you're in the field. I think we've gotten a little bit of a flavor of this already today. If you had to decide what would we teach our residents, dare I ask, how would we assess what they've learned? Where and when does it fit into a curriculum that's already overflowing with all of these other requirements that they have to do? Um, Who's gonna teach the curriculum? So at large academic centers in the US, we have decent neuroscience faculty who may be available, but the vast majority of programs in the states do not have neuroscience researchers or teachers to be able to administer the curriculum. To say nothing, my understanding is, is this is largely a group of educators. Can you imagine if you were being asked to teach one of those topics, the amount of anxiety that it would induce in you to be teaching things that, that feel so vast um, and large? And most importantly, how do we teach it well? So for most programs, the default is that they bring in their own experts with their own narrow areas of expertise and they give lectures on their topics. And we live with this fantasy as if we could stand up and stage a dramatic reading of our favorite neuroscience textbook and our residents will magically absorb everything we say. There's an entire field of study on how adults learn that suggests that less than 5% of what's presented in a lecture is retained. So there's a tragic irony if as the psychiatrists and neuroscientists studying how people learn, we don't take it into account in the way we teach our residents. So if we look at the entire graduate medical education model, PGME, I think, <laughs> um, it's entailed historically a series of central regulations, this is what you have to do, that have to then be implemented by the individual programs. And for cutting edge content like modern neuroscience, my argument would be that this just fundamentally doesn't work. The regulatory systems are too complex to adapt to the field as it changes, and the burden to create a new curriculum is far too high for any one program to be able to do it on its own. So 
If we want to think about the future of graduate medical education, it has to be about how are we going to work together to achieve a common goal. And my central tenet would be, in the same way that cutting edge science requires teamwork and collaboration, so too does cutting edge education. And it was particularly striking looking at everybody's slides today, the number of collaborators that everybody has for the science they're doing. Why don't we have the same thing for education? So to this end, about three years ago, a group of us got together and created the National Neuroscience Curriculum Initiative. And our goal was really simple. We wanted to create a set of open resources to help improve the teaching of neuroscience and psychiatry. It's work that I've been doing with Mike Travis, who's co-chairing the commission, uh, and Melissa Arbuckle from Columbia. And we started by coming up with a set of guiding principles. Foremost, it has to be an integrative patient-centered approach. How do we take the neuroscience content and put it alongside all of the other rich traditions in our field? It has to be clinically relevant for our residents um, and connected to everything else we're already doing. How do we teach well, respecting principles of adult learning theory? It's not enough to lecture. It, it's not going to work. It, th there's a place, but we have to think about how do we engage our learners actively with this content. We wanted to be able to create an adaptable frame so that anyone anywhere would feel comfortable that they could pick up our resources and they would be comfortable implementing it. It's not enough for me and Mike and Melissa to be able to do these things in our own programs. We want anyone to say, I can pick this up and do this myself. And again, we knew it had to be a collaborative effort across sites and institutions. So uh, at the level of the resident, much of this distills down to what we've called the Insel objective. Um, we do love Tom Insel. Um, and, and this very simple idea, residents will incorporate a modern neuroscience perspective as a core component of every formulation and treatment plan. We have three overarching learning objectives. The first is that they'll appreciate the importance of neuroscience to the future of psychiatry and the way we'll approach patient care. They'll demonstrate an understanding of core concepts in neuroscience, including how complex interactions between environmental stressors and disruptions in neural circuitry can contribute to different psychiatric disorders and that they'll be able to serve as ambassadors of neuroscience who can thoughtfully communicate findings to different audiences. So to make this work, we knew we were gonna have to operate on multiple levels. So first was to have a set of comprehensive online resources that anybody could go to anytime and find good teaching materials. Second was a series of teaching modules. What would this actually look like in a classroom? And this is where we spent a, a lot of our time from the beginning, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. And last was to think about an organizational infrastructure that it would allow the initiative to grow. So I want to dig in a little bit to the teaching modules and give you a sense of, of what we mean when we talk about this. So when we're using this phrase, we're thinking each module reflects one approach for how you could teach neuroscience in a way that reflects adult learning. This is about process over content. Once you have the process, you can plug in whatever content you like. Um, and we knew that there would have to be resources for anybody who wanted to implement this. So for any particular session that there would be a teacher's guide that would have what's the script for the session effectively, what are the questions you're going to ask, what are the answers, what are background readings that you could turn to. In many cases, we have videos of experts teaching those exact sessions so you could watch it. Again, we want to make this as easy as possible for you to be able to pick up and use off the shelf. So as we started this, uh, one of the first things we started with was basic neuroscience and neuroanatomy. We think it's really important. People need to know basic neuroanatomy. This is also one of the topics that is notoriously most challenging. People come in and lecture and everybody goes to sleep. Uh, we uh, approach it a little bit differently. So we start by handing out Play-Doh and we ask people to make a brain out of Play-Doh. And we give you a video that you can watch to see how to do it. Hello, my name is Josh Gordon from Columbia University and I'm going to show you how to build your brain out of Play-Doh. This is a speeded up version. <laughs> Josh is really good with Play-Doh, but not that good. <laughs> so the actual video is about six minutes long, I think. And um, this, this was the talent scouting moment at which Josh was pegged for future greatness. Um, and as he's going through, he's talking about the functional significance of each of these regions, connections to clinical pathology, et cetera. So on one hand, it seems like something that should be pretty simple. It's actually pretty hard. It, it packs a little bit of a punch. Um, we often pair this with a 3D brain app exercise. So you can go to the Genes to Cognition website from Cold Spring Harbor. They have a really cool app for your iPhone, free. Um, we give them different images, say go on to the app, identify the region, what's the functional significance, what conditions might have um, dysfunction within these regions. 
So another exercise, very easy for uh, somebody to teach and a really rich learning experience for people. One of the core modules we designed was the Integrative Case Conference, which is really straight to the intel objective that residents will be able to incorporate a neuroscience perspective into formulation. So the way we run these, this is something that I do at Yale most weeks, um, probably about 26 weeks a year from October through May. Um, each week we have one of the residents write up a case. We post the case onto their own closed website. Everybody's expected to read the case and formulate the case on their own before they come in. The morning of the conference, whoever's case it is, they present their formulation and then we save 15 to 20 minutes for group discussion. Uh, we think peer supervision is a core professional skill and we wanna give them a chance to practice. We then bring in three different experts reflecting diverse perspectives, so typically a neuroscientist, a psychotherapist, and a social psychiatrist. Depends on the case, depends on the week. Uh, but each to explore a different piece of the case, we tell them five to 10 minutes, uh, how would you think about this case? How would it affect your treatment? And then we have time to bring it back together to really think about how do you make it relevant for the person sitting in front of you. This is a cool module. It's one that works extremely well. We were worried about implementation and what it would feel like for other programs to try to do this. So if you wanted to run this, we have a facilitator's guide that describes how this kind of thing works. Uh, for the PTSD one, uh, there's a script that goes with that. We give you the Department of Defense treatment guidelines, which for PTSD turn out to be very good. Uh, basic neuroscience review article from Carrie Ressler. We have videos of experts or people purporting to be experts um, talking about the case from each of those different perspectives. Um, and we've now created for a bunch of these mini videos just of the neuroscience expert. So if you wanted to run a case on delusional disorder, for example, there's a 10 minute clip of Phil Corlett talking about the neurobiology of delusional disorder. So most programs have said um, they're very comfortable with the psycho and social perspectives. It's just the neuroscience piece that they're lacking. And so we'll give you that resource um, along with additional readings. One of my favorite modules has been neuroscience in the media. So we've all had the experience of being at a party and somebody says, hey, did you see the front page article about uh, cheese is crack? Or my recent favorite, women who eat full fat yogurt are happier, so don't believe the smug lady in the yoplait like commercials. Um, I just read it. Um, so one of our core learning objectives is that our residents will be able to serve as ambassadors of psychiatry and neuroscience. So Let's do that in the classroom. So for this module, we start every classroom by reviewing popular media. It could be from the New York Times, it could be from the Huffington Post, your favorite podcast, we've used the Colbert Report, like whatever it is, we don't care. Um, we then spend some time critiquing the media. So what were the central claims? What biases were present? I'm curious what the media is like here in the US, there's usually significant stigma that infuses any psych article that we see. Um, what do you imagine a patient or a family member might ask you if they saw this piece and came into your office? Um, and then find the science that answers this question. Uh, so we're going back to the articles. You don't necessarily have to read the entirety of the article. Usually the media coverage is so far off that reading the abstract and intro and maybe the discussion gets you there. Uh, but go back, find the answers to those questions, and then everybody has the chance to role play how would you communicate with the lay audience about this. So one of our favorite sample sessions is a awesome radio lab piece with a British journalist who travels to the desert outside of LA to a army base where they zap her brain with electricity and train her to become a sniper. It sounds pretty preposterous. Um, it's fun, but it's pretty preposterous. Except when you dig in and you start reading about transcranial direct current stimulation and the studies that they're talking about are actually, they're much better than you would think they were. Let me, let me say it that way. So here's the article that we would recommend. Here is a teacher's guide that has um, description of the session, answers to all of those questions from both parts, a script of how you might role play talking about this with a patient, uh, and then a video of somebody running this exact session so you can see what it looks like. So these are just a couple of examples to give you a sense of what our modules look like. Um, we have a, a number of other teaching modules at this point. I'm not gonna run through all of them. Um, the Talking Pathways to Patients is worth uh, mentioning just because these are brief videos, usually eight to 10 minutes, uh, demonstrating how a neuroscientist might talk to a patient with borderline personality disorder or substance use disorder or PTSD about the neurobiology of their condition and how it's relevant to their treatment uh, and giving people a chance to role play how they would do that. Again, it's video based, so the person administering this doesn't need to be an expert you're role-playing what you're seeing from an expert. So 
I, I have a much longer version of the slides, but it seems a little bit silly for me to stand here lecturing when the whole point is that we don't believe in lectures. So instead what I want to do is uh, give you guys a taste of what our curriculum is all about and run a quick module with you. Um, this is one of our new ones called Find It, Draw It, Know It. It's designed to help teach basic neuroscience, so this is really a, a very basic one. Um, for everything we do, we think for teaching and learning to be effective, we have to affectively engage with our audience. It has to feel relevant and interesting. Um, so we're gonna start by watching a movie. It's fun, it's about three minutes long, and your task is just to try to be present and uh, enjoy the movie. It's not really an enjoyable movie. It's probably the wrong choice of words. But be present. So hopefully everybody's had a mindful experience of this. Um, so part two, everybody, I see people have paper from their program. So your task here is to draw the circuit involved in generating her or your, depending on your reaction, fear response. Um, this is hard. It seems like it should be easy, but it's really hard. This is just for you. We're not gonna collect your answers. Don't show them to anyone. So don't worry whether you get it right or wrong. This is just for your own formative feedback learning experience. Um, it's something I'd probably call a varsity exercise. Usually we'd be giving you a template that looks like this that you could draw on. But you guys are awesome, you don't need it. So, so take 60 seconds and just sketch out what you think the basic pathway would be. Do you want the brain picture up? If you don't answer, I will call on you.
think Andy's on our website looking at the answer. <laughs> 20 more seconds. She's scared. That's that's all we need here. <laughs> yeah, she she well, she's definitely hearing things, right? There's things falling. So, <laughs> um, all right. So everybody's had the chance for their own learning experience here. Now we're going to show you a video that's going to have um, some version of an answer, and we'd encourage you to draw along as you go. Um, this is a simulated exercise. D draw if you like. But um, so here's our uh, brief video. Imagine you were to describe to a friend how you felt while watching this video. You might use words such as scared, apprehensive, and anxious. All of these words could be used to describe a feeling of fear. This is one of our central emotions, and obviously critical for survival. So, how does the brain create this emotion? Over the next five minutes, we're going to work together to review the brain circuits responsible for the fear response. We should acknowledge up front, you'll be offering a macroscopic perspective on a very complex circuit. We think this is a great starting place to orient yourself to key neural circuitry and can serve as a foundation for future exploration. With that in mind, pick up your pens and draw along with us. Let's start by drawing the amygdala. We're going to start here because this is the central region responsible for coordinating the orienting information for the fear response. While we're drawing it, please note its location in the medial temporal lobe, as visible in this image from the 3D brain. Okay, so we all felt ourselves getting stirred up by the movie. What was the first thing that happened to trigger this fear response? The first thing, of course, was having the signal come in. In the case of this movie, we are receiving both visual and auditory information. Let's start with the visual and take a quick look at a diagram of the visual system to orient yourselves. So you can see here that the signal is first coded in the retina, comes through the optic nerve, the lateral paniculate nucleus, which is a relay station in the thalamus, and then goes back to the primary visual cortex. So let's go ahead and draw that. Retina to the LGN, which is in the thalamus, the primary visual cortex. And then, of course, it's going to go to secondary association cortices in both directions. Dorsally for location, and ventrally for object recognition. And from there, the signal may be transmitted to the amygdala. For what it's worth, it's thought that there may be a fast pathway from the LGN straight to the amygdala. This would allow for a faster orienting reaction in the event of a life-threatening situation. At the same time, we are also receiving auditory information. This will be coded in the cochlea, passed through some brainstem nuclei, carried up to the inferior colliculate, the medial paniculate nucleus, and then to the primary auditory cortex. From there, you would have similar location pathways go through and object recognition pathways ventrally. Signal may go from these association cortices to the amygdala. And again, there may be a fast pathway directly from the MGN to the amygdala that enables a more rapid orienting response. So our first step is getting signal in from the outside world. The next piece of this puzzle, though, is that the amygdala needs to interpret what's happening. To do this, there has to be some context for the signal that we're getting. The context is going to be coming from a few key brain regions. First, it's going to be the hippocampus, which is also conveniently in green in our 3D brain map image to the side. If we draw the hippocampus, it would be deep in the temporal lobe. The hippocampus allows us to use memories of previous events to interpret the current situation. There's also signal coming from the insula, which is involved in integrating a variety of internal representations, including somatosensory. And critically, different regions within the prefrontal cortex play a major role. Among these, the anterior cingulate is involved in interpreting signals and resolving conflicting information. And the medial prefrontal cortex has inhibitory projections that allow it to regulate output of the amygdala. So how does this all work? Well, as you're watching this video, we presume that no one had a massive fear panic response. Your brain is able to use contextual clues, such as being in a classroom surrounded by colleagues and recognizing that this was an educational event focusing on the neurobiology of fear, to know that this is a safe context and to appropriately regulate your fear and anxiety. We presume that for the woman in the film, this is not the case. She is living this terrifying situation, and we can see from her reaction that she is appropriately mobilizing a full fear response. Of note, abnormalities in this regulatory process, perhaps including hypofunction of the medial prefrontal cortex, may play a major role in the development of anxiety disorder. Okay, so we have a signal coming in, and we have systems in place to help the amygdala interpret context. 
So the last step now is to generate the actual fear response. To illustrate this, I'm going to bring up a different image because it's really hard to see the midline structure from this view. So now we have a sagittal view. The amygdala is kind of hard to see here. It would be sitting underneath the temporal lobe, which would be off the screen a little bit closer to you. The amygdala would be sending out output signals to a number of regions that will be involved in generating the fear response. One, of course, is going to be the hypothalamus, the H and the HPA axis. This will generate the neuroendocrine response that will ultimately cause the adrenal glands to release cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. The second region that's going to be involved is the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is going to help generate a freeze response, a common response to fearful situations that is well preserved across species. The amygdala will also send signals to a series of brainstem nuclei. These include the locus ceruleus, which will release norepinephrine, and the ventral tegmental area, which will release dopamine. Collectively, these nuclei will help mediate the sympathetic nervous system's response, including increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, etc. The amygdala will also send a signal up to the basal ganglia and to the striatum to help coordinate and integrate a more complex motor response. Okay, so that's our entire pathway. Find it, draw it, know it. If you think you're ready, go ahead and try it from scratch on your own. So I'm hearing some laughter as if that feels like it might be a rich task to do. So this is, this is a fascinating meta process uh, for us. So, so ordinarily, we would, we would have people now try to draw it on their own. Um, we're obviously not in a classroom and, and doing that. I think one of the challenges of, of building a neuroscience curriculum is, is bridging that gap between where the experts are and where our trainees are. And I think when our experts come in and they talk about PTSD and anxiety disorders, they assume that everybody already knows all of this stuff. And my experience is that our trainees know much, much less than we think they do. And so this is an exercise. I don't expect anybody to get this on the first try, but you can all now go to the website and watch it as many times as you want. And I would feel very comfortable after having done the exercise once to say, you know, we're having this class next week on PTSD. I need you to know this before you come in. And yeah, you're gonna draw it before class starts. Once you've given them a, a six minute video, I don't feel bad about that at all. So um, hopefully that gives you a flavor uh, of, of what some of these exercises are like. Uh, for the sake of time, um, I wanna just push forward a little bit and we, we can come back to that if you guys like. Uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the organizational infrastructure and how do we actually get this curriculum to work. So for us, again, this has been all about collaboration. Uh, Jane Eisen is the chair of our advisory board. Uh, we have a learning collaborative um, as well that, that we've thought of. And, and I think the key thing here is just to recognize that these are all stakeholders from around the country. They represent all of the geographical regions in the US. They're big programs, they're small programs. It's a diverse collection of people who help us understand what are the needs of our learners, recognizing that they're very diverse. For us, a huge piece uh, has been thinking about how do we help our faculty who are likely intimidated by the prospect of teaching a neuroscience curriculum on their own feel comfortable doing so. So we've been running an annual uh, meeting that we call the Brain Conference uh, that's focused on uh, faculty development for how to teach neuroscience effectively. Uh, these were the first three years. We just had the fourth year earlier this month. Uh, it's been really gratifying to see the um, number of program directors who want to come increasing from year to year. We started at 140. We're now up over 270 who come to the annual training. And the number of people who report coming back from the meeting and then feeling comfortable implementing. So we survey each year, and it's now more than 70 75% of people who will say that they've implemented based on what we've done. We're spending a lot of time trying to engage with all of our stakeholders. So this is our map of where we've been lately. And now we can add the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London to our, to our world tour. Um, we've been working a lot with the relevant organizations in the US, so, so both training organizations like um, Association for Academic Psychiatry and ADPERT, but also the scientific organizations, ACNP and SOBP, uh, who have been very generous in their support. We're spending lots of time thinking about other ways to outreach. Um, we have the Facebook thing that I don't personally like, but I understand that's what people use. Um, a, a fascinating note, uh, the very first post onto Facebook when we started was from somebody in Switzerland. So um, from the beginning, there's been more of an international presence than we ever anticipated, and uh, it's been an interesting meta process. We also have collaborators in Brazil at this point, and uh, one of our team just went to Mozambique to present. So um, outcomes. Um, 
So the first thing that we're really focused on is have we been able to generate content that, that can be used? That was, that was really our first thing, and can we do so in a collaborative manner? Uh, we now have 10 to 12 unique modules, again, each of those reflecting a way to teach neuroscience, and within those we have more than 60 different unique sessions, each focusing on one specific content domain. This reflects the work of more than 60 authors from 30 different institutions, so we're incredibly uh, proud of how much of a collaborative effort that's turned out to be. Um, and a number of publications, including we now have a uh, clinical commentary that appears online with each issue of biological psychiatry. So um, uh, for these, we've really tried to take, again, one core idea that we think people might not know about and communicate lucidly uh, and accessibly to trainees. So if anybody has been having the feeling today of saying, my gosh, I've never heard of the Habenula, check out our commentary on the Habenula. Um, I, I was kind of pleased with how it turned out. <laughs> um, but I think this is one of those areas where it's, where it's a super cutting edge topic, and I think it's really hard. I know for my residents, we, we frequently have the experience of things that the neuroscientists would take for granted, our trainees have just never heard of. And so we need to have clear, accessible resources to help catch people up. Um, of course, our primary goal is, are people using our materials? Um, you know, if, if stuff sits on a server and, and nobody ever touches it, um, we're, we're wasting our time. So from our website in the past two years, so this is from March of 2015 to this month, um, it's been pretty cool. So uh, 132 different countries have been using it um, with a really huge number of unique users and page views and all these things. I realized that you guys were probably gonna look at this and say, huh, I can't actually see. So, so we made up a special figure. Um, <laughs> I'm very curious how closely this corresponds with Wendy's uh, tour around the country, <laughs> and, and if that's where the little dots are on this. Um, and for us, the, the most gratifying thing is, um, it's now, it's more than 75, it's probably up over 100 different residency programs in the US who have started using our materials. So, as far as next steps, um, we're really focused on continuing to expand resources. Neuroscience is huge, there are lots of topics that we've covered, and there are lots of topics that we still need to cover, so we're working very hard on that. Uh, we're thinking a lot about dissemination and really about faculty development, recognizing that helping people implement the curriculum is a huge part of the initiative. Uh, we're thinking a lot about technological opportunities, so we've done webcast case conferences, for example. Um, we've now been doing a quasi-standing case conference with Brazil, so the University of Sao Paulo sends us a case for which they don't have a neuroscience expert, and we recruit an expert, and we Skype in, and have a case conference. Um, we've done some of those as um, open courses as well, which have been really popular. So one example of how we can be thinking about technology. And the other half of this is really starting to get to assessment at the level of the individual learner. So we're now working on building an app that will be an assessment tool as well. So that you can log in and, and um, you can get a series of questions and if you get them right, cool. And if you don't, it will link you directly to the content on our website that will answer that question. Um, so we think it's really important to be able to start tracking those outcomes. So I will stop there, um, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Question. I must admit, I've fallen in love with the Habenula now. It's great. It's a lovely piece you've done. It starts with really inspiring, uh, not parts of St. Louis, aren't this visible? Yeah. And then you describe it, its function. It says it's a vocal pessimist tuned to any possibility of misfortune, and then say this is like eel in the brain, your own internal eel. <laughs> Beautiful, well done. Any eels in the room that you ask a question? <laughs> been fascinated. That, that was uh, Twitter-worthy, so, so we've been tracking like the alt metrics that our pieces get, and the Eeyore line is the one that got picked up yeah. and, and uh, yeah. everybody loves. It's bonkers. St. Crew's School Inspiring and ended with A.A. Mill. That's the journey. <laughs> so then I didn't, I'm sorry, I should actually look, when I asked if anyone wants to ask questions, did anyone actually indicate yes. that? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes good. somebody asked me a question here. Um, so I'm wondering how you, ah, were, how you go about choosing content, because if I'm watching the video, and being a, somebody who's an avid reader of Panksep, I would say uh, that, firstly, there are two triggers to panic in the brain. There's a suffocation trigger and a separation trigger. And, uh, and that when you lock the door, you have a claustrophobic anxiety. And that would be a different, it wouldn't be the amygdala. Yeah. So there's an entire separation system in the brain that, that didn't get a mention. So there's, there's the threat of fear from, threat from the environment kind of fear which is amygdala, and then there's separation anxiety, which goes to all of the attachment disorders. 
which is another bit of the brain. So how, how do you decide which bit you're going to talk about in your module? What, whatever we decide, somebody's unhappy with us. So uh, it's, it's just the reality. <laughs> um, and, and we get it from both sides. So, so the, the students say, wow, that's a lot of detail. And did you really need to put that in? Did you really need to put that in? Did you really need to put that in? And the experts say, really, that is so reductionistic. Um, so you know, we, 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 we work very hard to, you know, it, it, a lot of this is, is you know, you're, you're picking an angle, and there are many angles, and, and there should be a separate piece on panic would be the easiest solution to that. All of our stuff is peer reviewed, so we send it out to experts in the field, and, and they'll sign off on it. I'm, I'm more concerned that if, if we have a mistake that creeps in rather than an area of omission. Um, I think we've been pretty clean so far. We, we, have, um, we have a lot of experts who help review our content. Um, it, it's a very fair point. So, so, so everything is more complex than we can possibly cover. Okay. Yep. The front. Ah, I, I, right. just, as, as the last thought, I, you know, it's, it's it is the learning objective, though, right? Like my learning objective for that is I want my resident to be able to describe that particular system, and if if my resident can stand up and list those regions as as central to the fear response, I'm pretty happy. So I, I think that's why we ended up at that editorial level. I'm gonna say say who you are. Oh, we go way back. Mm -hmm. My name is Claire, and I'm a current medical student at Imperial and one of the Pathfinder Fellows, fellows with RC Psych. So I think it would be a wonderful resource for medical students to use. I just wondered whether you've tracked the engagement with keen future psychiatrists at medical schools or those revising neuroscience and neuroanatomy. Yes, yeah, so we've been having lots of conversations about this this week. Um, when we started, we, we're three program directors course organizers. Um, and so we're really focused on residents, and that was how we defined it. But, but we aim almost all of our stuff for what we would say is the second year resident. But, but realistically, the second year resident is the same as what would be our third year medical student, and what's probably the same as what would be an attending consultant in the community. Um, so we are thinking very much broadly, anybody could pick this up. A lot of people are using our materials with medical students. The medical students love it. So particularly the neuroscience and the media is a great way to get medical students engaged. Um, and we've talked a lot about different outreach exercises that we might do with medical students to, um, to help uh, improve engagement. Um, it, it's from the conversation this week, it sounds like it's, it's harder to attract medical students into psychiatry here than in the States. I thought a fascinating sort of meta process in uh, the last talk was, the whole thing on biotypes of depression was from uh, Andrew Drysdale, who was an applicant to our program this year. Right, so he's a graduating medical student who's done that work. Um, and he's normative for the field at this point. So um, it's a very, it, it looks very different, and I think that's all about engagement with neuroscience uh, before they get to residency. Well, I love the use of the normative when you could have used normal. <laughs> Good. Any last questions? <laughs> yeah. No, hey. Diane. No, Mike's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Thank you, Diane Gosler. I'm a service user. Um, I think you said that people retained five percent. Yeah. Is there any tool you can use um, to help ensure that maybe they return retain? Sorry, the most important five percent is if there's a five percent that you want to get over. Effective teaching. Sorry. <laughs> Effective teaching. Yeah. <laughs> so I walk away, I mean, I literally will say for, for a class that I'm preparing, what's the one thing I want you to remember one yeah. year from now? Right. Okay. That's it. I, I think we try to do too much. We're overly ambitious and it's not possible. So to end then, what is the one thing you want us to remember <laughs> one year from now? So I thought about this deeply. The, the, the oh, question okay. was... I thought I'd catch you out. No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I spent a lot of time wondering, is it, is it totally crazy to do that exercise with this group? And at the end of the day, I said, no, I think, I think six months from now or a year from now, people will remember having done this crazy video um, and that it's a totally different style of learning and that it probably made you a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but it probably tied you into content that you didn't know. And if you ever wanted to know it, you can go back and you can find the video. So, uh, if, so, so my objective is you all have a sense of how we think about education um, and a, a different paradigm and uh, a shared collaborative approach. Okay. Thanks so much, David. That was cool. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so quick summary of what have we done. I asked uh, Anne, who's in the audience from the uh, Neuroscience Association, what was the, what was the message of today? And she said, neuroscience is great. 
There we are, nice and straightforward. I asked Wendy the same, and she said, psychiatry is great. Equally straightforward, we just need to marry the two of you, have children, and that'll be the, the, the offspring will be exactly what we want. Now, what have we done? Well, we've, we've heard it from the top, literally, with uh, Jan, uh, John, uh, Carl, Ed, and co, of what is going on in the world of neuroscience, but of course, that's not the exact challenge that we have. The challenge, of course, is to move that into direct clinical relevance, and we heard directly from Rebecca how we can do that, moving straight into a clinical trial, a relevant clinical trial in anorexia, and we heard from Mary Ellen, who I think is the only person who will still be practicing psychiatry in 2047, I can be reasonably confident about that, uh, what, uh, what the future would look like for her. And she also little, taught us all a little lesson that, you know, less, less is more, the less you say, the more audiences love you. Never forgotten that. I can't remember who told me on, tell me that. Now we have moved on. Ed reminded me just a few minutes ago that when we both did the MRC Psych at a rather similar time, the uh, neuroscience questions were, and I quote: were, First of all, it was describing the anatomy of the cranial nerve. Is that right? Cranial nucleus. Was it? Yeah. And the other one was the eye science for syphilis, which had already or only been worked out a hundred years ago at Queen Square. Probably by Ray, actually. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, but and that was the extent of what we had, and we have clearly moved on. But clearly, we have a long, long way to go. And I think there's a few things we might do when we do meet at Cambridge in the spring for the second of these conferences. I think one is to use more people like Diane as service users, because if they're engaging with this, that's finally going to be a way that we should be as well. I also think we should perhaps use a little bit more of the grand round format. I mean, you used the example of PTSD, David, and I did actually read your grand round, as it were, in, in archives last week. You seem to publish ar in archives the same way that Carl does in Nature, you bastard. Um, <laughs> but I mean, actually, it is a fascinating and, and, you know, thing because you've also got to explain there's the world. You didn't quote me, by the way. I'd have been much happier if you did. No citation, bad boy. Um, but you know, we've shown it's not just it's not even that it's not even as simple as you made it. It's even more com sorry, not even as it's more complex than you make it because your model will also have to explain the kind of things that we find in Iraq service personnel. You have to explain why is it that certain emotions, shame, and it's not trauma, it's shame and guilt. It's about errors of omission and commission. Being hit by friendly fire is far far more traumatic psychologically than it is being shot by the Taliban, completely. We know also, for example, that measures of leadership, measures of leadership and cohesion are the strongest predictors of units' mental health at a unit level. We know that civilians exposed to a similar trauma will have something like four or five times higher rates than professionals. And among professionals, reservists have three times the rate of traumatic disorder than regulars, again, for the same things. So these are all things that are going to have to be explained as you incorporate the social into these complicated biological models. So let's see a few more grand rounds, perhaps or grand round style presentations at the next time in actually using these concepts to illustrate clinical dilemmas and problems. In other words, I mean, Tom Insull seemed to be asking for that. Do you mean kind of the Insull principle? Of the in is it, can you say Insull principle? Well, you can when sober, but probably not, uh, probably not when you're not. So those are the kind of things that we need to go on. So, so who can we thank? Well, various people. First of all, obviously we want to thank David and the Gatsby and indeed his eminence grise, Sarah, sitting there very quietly, but who's been quietly behind all of this entire endeavor, and it wouldn't have happened with her. We have to thank Jeremy. We have lots of Jeremys in British politics at the moment. Um, you know, so whom, which Jeremy are you thanking? Is it Jeremy Hunt? Seems unlikely. Jeremy Corbyn? Even less likely. Um, <laughs> but actually, it's, it's Jeremy. It is, the, it is the era, the year for it. It's the Jeremy year, isn't it? But the particular Jeremy, Jeremy Farrer, and the welcome for, again, their support, particularly Wendy over there, and Gareth, who's actually also actually worked on this right from the start, full time, and has done so far. I say so far, because you can't rest on your laurels, mate, but an absolutely brilliant job. And during all this, the RC Site comms team have been tweeting an awful lot, as have many of you, but it's, uh, it, um, these things are often quite interesting how they happen, but I don't know if you noticed, but um, this is now trend trended on Twitter. Another thing you can't say when you're drunk. Trended on Twitter, we are number two on Twitter at the moment. Uh, we are be below only Red Nose Day. It's Red Nose Day, that is doing better. But we are above comic relief, so it's, it's a third. <laughs> and we're also, a fourth is no fault divorce. Explain that if you can, I certainly can't. Okay, we're not divorcing, this is a marriage that's gonna go on. Thank you very much for coming everyone, and well done. <laughs>